Καλημέρα σας. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ για τη συμμετοχή σας στην αναγόρευση της κυρίας Κάρεν Βαν Τάικ. Ε, θα ξεκινήσουμε με την προσφώνηση από τον Πρίτανη του Εθνικού και Καποδιστριακού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών, καθηγητή μελέτη ο Αθανάσιο Δημόπουλο. Κύριε Αντιπρίτανη, κύριε Κοσμήτορα, κυρία Πρόεδρε, κυρίες και κύριοι καθηγήτριες και καθηγητές, αγαπητές και αγαπητοί φοιτητές και φοιτήτριες. Με ιδιαίτερη τιμή λόγω της εμβέλειας και του σημαντικού έργου της τιμωμένης προσωπικότητας και τηρώντας την παράδοση του Ιδρύματός μας να αποδίδουμε τιμές σε προσωπικότητες που έχουν προσφέρει πολλαπλώ στην επιστήμη, Έχουμε σήμερα την ιδιαίτερη χαρά στην ιστορική μεγάλη αίθουσα του Πανεπιστημίου της απόδοσης της ύψησης τιμής της ανακήρυξης σε επίτιμη διδάκτορα του τμήματος της Αγγλικής Γλώσσας και Φιλολογίας της Φιλοσοφικής Σχολής του Εθνικού και Καποδεστριακού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών της καθηγήτριας Νέας Ελληνικής Γλώσσας και Λογοτεχνίας, κυρίας Κάρεν Βαν Ντάικ. Η απονομή του τίτλου αποτελεί ένα φόρο τιμής για την εξαιρετική συμβολή της στην καλλιέργεια της νέας ελληνικής γλώσσας και λογοτεχνίας της Διασποράς, των μεταφραστικών σπουδών, της πολυγλωσσίας, της γεωγραφίας της γλώσσας, των σπουδών φύλου και της ποιησης. Η κυρία Ντάικ είναι καθηγήτρια νέας ελληνικής γλώσσας και λογοτεχνίας στο Πανεπιστήμιο Κολούμπια, έλαβε τους προπτυχιακούς και μεταπτυχιακούς τίτλους σπουδών από το Westland University, το Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο της Θεσσαλονίκη και την Οξφόρδη. Δημιούργησε και διεύθυνε με σημαντικό έργο το διατηματικό Hellenic Studies Program από το 1988 έως το 2016. Είναι κριτικός λογοτεχνίας και μεταφράστρια, εκπαιδευμένη τόσο στις διαχρονικές παραδόσεις των κλασικών και των μεγάλων βιβλίων, όσο και στις πιο συγχρονικές προσεγγίσεις των σπουδών φύλου, της συγκριτικής λογοτεχνίας και των μεταφραστικών σπουδών. Ξεκίνησε την καριέρα της στην Αγγλία, στο King's College, διδάσκοντας ελληνικά σε Κυπρίους που είχαν μεγαλώσει στο Λονδίνο, ενώ παράλληλα συνέγραφε τη διατριβή της στην Οξφόρδη. Η Κάρεν Βαν ενδιαφέρεται να αναδείξει με το έργο της τους τρόπους με τους οποίους οι πολιτιστικές παραγωγές και ιδιαίτερα η ποιήση, με τη λεπτή προσοχή της στη φόρμα, μας βοηθούν να αναλύσουμε μεγαλύτερα κοινωνικά πρότυπα. Όπως γράφει και η ίδια σε μια προσπάθεια να αντιμετωπίσει τα περίπλοκα ζητήματα της άνησης ανάπτυξης μεταξύ πολιτισμών και γλωσσών, οι επιστημονικές της δραστηριότητες επικεντρώθηκαν όλο και περισσότερο στη μετάφραση. Το έργο της είναι πλούσιο και διεθνώς αναγνωρισμένο, έχει μάλιστα αντίκτυπο όχι μόνο στις νεοελληνικές σπουδέ, αλλά και στις μεταφραστικές σπουδέ και την παγκόσμια λογοτεχνία. Κυρίες και κύριοι, είναι ιδιαίτερη τιμή και χαρά να υποδεχόμαστε σήμερα την καθηγήτρια της νέας ελληνικής γλώσσας και λογοτεχνίας, κυρία Κάρεν Βαν Ντάικ, ως επίλεκτο μέλος, ως επίτιμη διδάκτορα του τμήματος της Αγγλικής Γλώσσας και Λογοτεχνίας και Φιλολογίας της Φιλοσοφικής Σχολής του ΕΚΠΑ. Σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ για την προσφορά σας. Παρουσίαση του έργου και της προσωπικότητας της τιμωμένης από την καθηγήτρια του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώσσας και Φιλολογίας της Φιλοσοφικής Σχολής του Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών, Μαρία Σιδηροπούλου. Translation Theory, Venuti 1995, highlighted two significant decisions facing the literary translator. The strategic significance of focusing, of choosing what to translate, because commercial considerations may point otherwise, and how to translate it. 
we're honoring Professor Karen Van Dyke today for both, for the strategic decision to focus on Greek poetry, feminist poetics, modern violence and dictatorship as a manifestation of moral and political crisis, and for the transparency with which she has transferred cultural forms and norms. On the assumption that literature can tell us what will happen before history has time to unfold, Professor Karen Van Dyck has focused on messages Greek poetry has disseminated and transferred the almost uncharted field of Greek poetry into English, placing Greek poets and their poetics in the political and literary context of contemporary Greece. Karen Van Dyck has worked on issues of translation, migration, diaspora, and gender. Um, she was the Kimon Dukas Professor of Modern Greek Language and Literature in the Classics Department at Columbia University, where she directed the program in Hellenic Studies and taught courses on modern, modern Greek and Greek diaspora literature. She received her BA from Wesleyan University, her MA from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and her PhD from Oxford University in medieval and mon modern languages. In 1997, Professor Van Dyck took on the full responsibilities of the Kimon Dukas Chair at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Kimon Dukas was born in Smyrna, Asia Minor, uh, and moved to the United States in 1922. He earned three degrees from Columbia, and after retirement, he established the Kimo Dukas Chair. Professor Van Dyck planned long-term projects such as graduate studies, interdisciplinary uh, planning, and established the Kimo Dukas Lecture Series to honor uh, the life of Kimo Dukas, focusing, among others, on issues uh, related to diaspora. Among the courses in modern Greek um, uh, language and literature, Professor uh, Van Dyck has taught numerous other courses, among which several survey and elective courses like the making of modern Greek poetry, uh, Greek American culture, diaspora literature, trans uh, multilingualism and translation, immigration, travel, translation, uh, writing and censorship, and many others. On the Kimon Dukas uh, lecture list, 1990-2032, uh, one may notice highly interesting topics presented by informed scholars including uh, Professor John Ciolis, who used to be a professor in the Department of English Language and Literature. Um, Karen Van Dyck has been visiting professor at Boazici University, um, Turkey, at Michigan, uh, Classics and Women's Studies, and at, at King's College, London, in Modern Greek Language. She's currently senior faculty fellow at the Heyman Center for the Humanities, Columbia, 2021-22. She's been awarded many fellowships, Fulbright, Marshall, American Council of Learned Societies, and the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Her latest awards for the Greek Poetry Collection Posterity measures in 2016 are the London Hellenic Prize 2016, New Statesman Peak of the Year in December 2016, and the Guardian Poetry of the Month, um, April 2016. I will not go through her 12 books and 33 articles except perhaps selectively. Um, not to mention, of course, her poetry translations, online projects, reviews and interviews in both Greek and English outlets. Greek and English outlets. Karen Van Dyck's research interests include translingualism, the merging of 
two or more languages in lit literary production, and her approach is a literary and cultural studies one, rather away from anthropological and other empirical methodologies, and um, um, deals with how cultural production may help us analyze social reality. Karen van Dijk suggests, suggests that the problem is not whether to translate, but how. And the questions she has concerned herself with in answering how to translate Greek poetry have been the following. How can I transfer a text, be it a poem or prose, when ellipses, what is left unsaid, is part of the message, especially under censorship? How can I possibly transfer the less static nature of women's writing, as opposed to the more established mode of male writing, especially if the poetic strategy emerges as a response to state action? How could translation strategies avoid potential misunderstandings, for instance, when a translation favors the visual poetics of a text at the expense of orality if the author intends to balance these features? How can I translate intertextuality, perhaps by creating references to literature in the reception culture, she concludes. Professor Van Dyck has been inherently optimistic in that she believes one can do more with less and that constraints are enabling rather than limiting. On this assumption, she has developed a highly receptive observational power to identify what Greek moments of crisis have produced poetry-wise, uh, what their typical features may be, and how they may be transferred into English. As a literary translation expert, she is very much aware of the compensation strategy in translation practice, namely the potential to restore what is lost from the source text, otherwise and elsewhere. The goal, she argues, is not to reproduce the source text, you can't, uh, but to learn from it so as to make something else possible in the new linguistic context acknowledging the linguistic and cultural differences. Her anthologies intend to change the way readers think about poetry in Europe, especially at the edges of it, uh, where the East and West merge. For instance, uh, her early production, um, 1998 book, The Rehearsal of Misunderstanding, comprises three translated collections of contemporary Greek women poets, Vera Lanaki, Jenny Mastoraki, Maria Laina, where Professor Van Dyck was both an editor and contributor and has deftly articulated the poet's qualities in English. This is a Wesleyan University Press publication. In another uh, 1998 book, Cassandra and the Census, Greek poetry since 1967, Professor Karen van Dijk analyzes how a feminist critique perspective emerges from Greek women's poetry at the time of the Greek junta, uh, despite censorship and consumerism. This is a Cornell University Press publication. In the scattered letters of Penelope, Professor Karen van Dyck has transferred poet Katerina Angelaki Rook's full retrospective collection into English when the work was presented at the Columbia Program in Hellenic Studies by Ray Wolf Press uh, Minneapolis. Jeff Schultz suggested that he was enchanted by the sensual lyricism, the beauty of the translated poems. Karen, he argued, has been the tireless and brilliant expert that we have relied on to make the book a success. The book received a Lannan Translation Award. Karen van Dyck's co-edited anthology, The Greek Poets Homer to the Present, is a landmark volume 
which spans three millennia of Greek poetry, transferring more than a, th a thousand poems and 200 poets into English, highlighting aspects of Greek poetic traditions. This is a co-edited uh, 2009 anthology, uh, which she co-edited together with Peter um, Constantine, Rachel Haddas, and Edmund Keeley. Her aesthetic emerges, the new Greek poetry in 2016, is another attempt to shape how the universal crisis impacted Greece by reconstructing its impact cross-culturally. This is a Penguin publication. I would like to read out Edmund Kelly's assessment of the Authority Measures Anthology. Uh, open quotation marks. Karen Van Dyck has collected an extraordinary group of poets and translators who are bound to put Greece, Greek poetry on the map again. I've seen it happen twice in my life with a generation of the 30s that included Gavafi, Seferis, Elitis, and Ritsos, and that reached world recognition. And again, during the dictatorship of the colonels, when the group that appeared in the Harvard Anthology 18 texts, 1972, uh, earned international recognition with the help of accomplished trans translators. Now, during another crisis in the country, we find exciting new voices emerging, and I'm convinced that they're once again saying something no one else is saying. Call it the knowledge that emerges from the undecide of devastation and the creative illumination that comes with tragedy, but something is going on in Greece that we aren't seeing in the news. I give this anthology my strongest support. Close quotation marks. Her approach in compiling the austerity measures anthology is bottom up. Uh, Professor Van Dyck chose venues where poetry is written in Greece rather than translators or themes or chronological order of emergence. Um, she began with poems produced within the Greek literary tradition, postponed presenting in your face poetry before she moved on to diaspora and multilingual contexts. So Greek production has been grouped as follows in austerity measures. Poets in literary magazines, DIY and small press uh, poets, poets in performance and across the arts, bookshops, cafes, poets, and the provinces. Border zones, uh, poets where cultures and, uh, and uh, poetry, sorry, between uh, cultures and languages, where people born elsewhere may originally be writing in Greek, thus practicing an inclusion strategy. Poetry, um, Professor Van Dyck suggests, plays the role of Cassandra, foretelling tragedies to come. She argues that only after austerity measures was finished did it become clear to her how the drama of borders and migrants, migrants and a sea impossible to patrol had emerged in Greek poetry some time ago. Another contribution Karen Van Dyck has made to Greek poetry and translation studies is that not only does her work manifest her own masterful potential for foregrounding aspects of Greek poetic tradition, but also offers a unique resource, a database of older and younger translators who have transferred Greek poetry into English as an essential part um, of the Western literary tradition. And she does that, this with an immense awareness of the specifics of intercultural transfer. The Department of English Language and Literature is extremely pleased to have suggested an honorary doctorate confirmation for Professor Van Dyck for selecting and cross-culturally disseminating aspects of contemporary Greek poetry 
in such a masterful manner. Thank you. Αναγόρευση της τιμωμένης, ανάγνωση των κειμένων του ψηφίσματος του τμήματος, της αναγόρευσης και του διδακτορικού διπλώματος από την Πρόεδρο του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώσσας και Φιλολογίας, καθηγήτρια Ασπασία Βελισσαρίου. Εθνικών και Καποδιστριακών Πανεπιστήμιων Αθηνών, ψήφισμα του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας της των Φιλοσόφων Σχολής. Τύχη αγαθή, πριτανεύοντος εν το Αθήνησιν Εθνικό και Καποδιστριακό Πανεπιστημίο, μελετίου Αθανασίου Κάπα Δημοπούλου, κοσμητεύοντος εν τη των Φιλοσόφων Σχολή Αχιλλέος Γάμα Χαλδεάκη και προεδροβούσης εν το τμήμα τη Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας Μαρίας Κάπα Σιδηροπούλου, έδοξεν ομοφόνος το τμήμα τη Κάρεν Βαν Ντάικ, γυναίκα έφτε πεφικίαν και παιδείας έμπλεων, εν κόσμο το νέο και εν Ελλάδη, την επιστήμη της φιλολογίας που δάσασαν, ου μιναλά και περί την μεταφραστική τέχνη ενδιατρύψασαν πολλά και ενέσημα επέρι των νέων ελληνικών ποιήσεων και των ποιητών αυτών πραγματευσαμένην και συγγραψαμένην, πλήθη ξένοντε και ελλήνων φοιτητών διδάξασα εν το περιονίμο της Νέας Υόρκης Πανδιδακτηρίο το Κολομβία, καλουμένο και αλαχού, γέραση πολλής και σπουδαίης τη μυθήσαν, προς δε τούτης εύνουν τη Ελλάδη και τη η μετέρα σχολή αίδια τελούσαν, έδοξε, λέγω, επενέσετε αυτήν και επίτιμον διδάκτορα του τμήματος αναδείξε, το δε ψήφισμα το δε μεμβράνη αναγράψε και την του τμήματος πρόεδρο εν τη αιθούση τη μεγάλη αναγνούσαν και τα στιμάς ανυπούσαν επιδούνε αυτή ειν αν ημέρα η αναγόρευση γέννητε καθά νενόμιστε. Εγένετο Αθήνηση μηνό Σεπτεμβρίου 8η και 10η έτους 9ου και 10ου και δυσχυλιοστού από Χριστού Γεννήσεως. Η πρόεδρος του τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας Μαρία Κάπα Σιδηροπούλου. Αναγόρευσης επιδίπερ το τμήμα Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας της των Φιλοσόφων Σχολής του Αθήνησιν Εθνικού και Καποδιστριακού Πανεπιστημίου Κάρεν Βαν Ντάικ αξίαν απέφυνε του επιτίμου διδακτορικού αξιώματος η δε των Φιλοσόφων Σχολήν τούτα απεδέξατο και ο πρίτανης τη, τη σχολής γνώμη επινεύει, διατάφτα εγώ, ασπασία, πίβελισαρίου, καθηγήτρια της Αγγλικής Λογο, Λογοτεχνίας και του Πολιτισμού, νεν δε του τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας Πρόεδρος, χρωμένη τη δυνάμη, ειν παρά των πανεπιστημιακών νόμων και του τμήματος έχω λαβούσα, Κάρεν Βαν Ντάικ, επίτιμον διδάκτορα του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας της των Φιλοσόφων Σχολής του Αθήνησιν Εθνικού και Καποδιστριακού Πανεπιστημίου, δημοσία αναγορεύω και πάσας αυτή τα προνομίας τα στο πανεπιστημιακό τούτο αξιώματι παρεπομένας από νέμο. Εγένετο Αθήνηση μηνός Μαρτίου 3η και 20η έτους Δευτέρου και Εικοστού 
και δυσχιλιοστού από Χριστού γεννήσεως. Η πρόεδρος του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας, Ασπασία Π. Βελισσαρίου. Ελληνική Δημοκρατία. Πριτανεύοντος εν το Αθήνησιν Εθνικό και Καποδιστριακό Πανεπιστημίο, μελετίου Αθανασίου Κάπα Δημοπούλου, καθηγητού της θεραπευτικής ογκολογίας αιματολογίας, κοσμητεύοντος εν τη των φιλοσόφων σχολή Αχιλλέος Γάμα Χαλδεάκη, καθηγητού της βυζαντινής μουσικολογίας και ψαλτικής τέχνης, και προερευούσεις εν το τμήμα τη Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας Ασπασίας Π. Βελισσαρίου, καθηγητρίας της Αγγλικής Λογοτεχνίας και του Πολιτισμού, Κάρεν Δαν Ντάικ, από δόγματος ομοθήμου της των φιλοσόφων σχολής, εις τους επίτιμους διδάκτορες εγκρίνομεν, μηνός Μαρτίου 3η και 20η, έτους Δευτέρου και 20ου και δυσχυλιοστού, από Χριστού γεννήσεως. Ο Πρίτανης, μελέτης Αθανάσιος Δημόπουλος, ο Κοσμήτρο Αχιλέας Χαδεάκης, η πρόεδρος του Τμήματος Αγγλικής Γλώτης και Φιλολογίας, Ασπασία Πίβελη Σαρίου. Περιέντηση της τιμωμένης με την Τίβενο της σχολής από τον Κοσμήτορα της Φιλοσοφικής Σχολής, καθηγητή Αχιλέα Χαλδεάκη. Ομιλία της τιμωμένης καθηγήτριας Karen Van Dyck με τίτλο «Translating Greece». Ευχαριστώ θερμά την καθηγήτρια Σιδεροπούλου και όλους εδώ που ήρθατε. Α, θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά, αλλά χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ που σας βλέπω και σας α, έχω ακούσει τώρα για αυτά που μου είπατε. Uh, it is a great honor to receive this doctorate from the English department, and in particular, from the Interdisciplinary MA in Translation at the University of Athens, since translation is my passion. As my teacher and mentor, the much-loved translator Edmund Keeley, has just died at 94, I thought I would use this occasion to talk about one of his favorite poets, George Seferis, and to read with you one of his and Philip Sherard's translations in the manner of G.S., with its haunting line, Opu que na taxidepso i alada me pligoni. Wherever I travel, Greece wounds me. I do this in memory of him, but also as a centennial tribute to 1922 and those then and now who have been uprooted from their homes. 
It is a call to translate as a way to bring people together across languages and to retranslate when new times make new interpretations necessary. If we accept that poems can be read in multiple ways, sometimes conflicting ways, we can also understand that poems can be translated in multiple ways. Translations are interpretations, after all, and they are beholden to dictionaries, but as we know from how different the King James Bible and the Revised Standard Version are, right, the possibility for variation, even while maintaining semantic correspondence, is infinite, infinite and always revealing. Let me give my reading of the poem and then explain the achievement of Keeley and Sherrard's translation and end by gesturing at what a new translation might do. In the Manner of G.S. is a poem that sets out to define G.S.'s, George Seferis's manner. The poem is about whether or not Greece can move beyond its windless ampas in 1936 and avoid a dictatorship, metaxasis. But it is also about living outside Greece during times of national turmoil and how a certain kind of poetry written in a certain manner or style, metotropo to gamma sigma, can best assuage the pain of xenitia. According to the Philhellene novelist Henry Miller, exile is the source of Seferius' genius. His love for his country, quote, a result of patient discovery following years of absence abroad, end of quote. Seferis often signals his life outside of Greece with the place names he adds at the end of poems, Koritsa, Drenova, Cairo, South Africa, London, Cyprus. For him, his years abroad recall how he and his family were forced to leave his home, their home in Asia Minor during the population exchange of 1922. Though Seferis experienced a host of different kinds of displacement, political refugee, student, consul, ambassador in a government, in exile, poet laureate abroad, all these experiences repeat for him the childhood sense that he wasn't where he was meant to be and increased the duty he felt to make Greek, Greece and Greek poetry great again. But what if the manner or style Seferis outlines in the poem is not only about writing a kind of poetry that can live up to the ancients and connects ancient to biblical koine, to Byzantine Greek, to the Cretan Renaissance and the folk song, but also about translating in a way that imagines the Greek language as one continuous tradition. So that translating Homer or the Bible is considered translating Greek to Greek. This is what Seferis is imagining, right? From Seferis' journals, the entries, it's clear his most intense times of feeling out of place coincide with periods of translating in this way. Homer, Aeschylus, Heraclitus in Albania in 1936, Song of Songs, Asmas Maton, Euripides Bachai, and Revelations, Anacalypse, during his time in the Middle East in 1952 to 1955. It is not only that he chooses texts about exile to translate during these times, but that their translation is exilic, structured in a way that imagines things as closer and more similar than they are. Seferis's poem, in the manner of G.S., written in Koritsa, Albania, during his first posting in the Foreign Service, can be read as comparing two different kinds of translation interlingual via <laughs> via glossiki metaphors ne? between two languages and intralingual ne endoglossiki within one language it can be seen as posing the question of which helps more when contending with feelings of homelessness and hopelessness Seferis is already very accustomed to interlingual translation from his student years in Paris, when he would bring over the poetry of the French and English poets he loved, Paul Valéry, 
T.S. Eliot. Um, but the new, this new way, which translates ancient Greek texts and imagines them as already modern Greek, is something he begins to explore in earnest in Albania. From the beginning of the poem, both kinds of translation are apparent. The title, in the manner of G.S., is an example of interlingual translation, since it translates the French à la manière de. While the flurry of mythic characters and places that are at once ancient and modern Greek, Pelion, the centaur, Mycenae, Helen, would be considered examples of intralingual translation. Both interlingual and intralingual translations, andigrafes and metagrafes, as Soferis will come to call them, are presented as ways of bringing nearer what is out of reach. But while the interlingual, with its reference to poetic depths in European poetry, exposes the problem of minority and belatedness in, of, of modern Greece in relation to major literatures, and like this is Soferis, right? And he explains that it is the least satisfying way of translating because of this. The intralingual for him, which channels ancient Greek, Koine, Byzantine, is more promising since it, it seems to maintain a linguistic and cultural continuity with the past and with it its kudos. Opu kena taxidepso yelada me pligoni. Stopilio mesas tis castanies, to pukamiso, to kendavro, glistrusa mesas ta fila. Yana tilikti sto kormimu kathos anevana tinanifora ke ithalasa makoluthuse anavenonda skefti santo idragiro thermometro os punavrume tanera tuvunu. Wherever I travel, Greece wounds me. On Pelion among the chestnut tree, the centaur shirt slipped through the leaves to fold around my body as I climbed the slope and the sea came after me, climbing too, like mercury in a thermometer till we found the mountain waters. So Ferris's line, wherever I travel, Greece wounds me, at first refers to the dissatisfaction of interlingual translation, the fact that when comparing modern Greece with other, modern Greek with other Western languages like French and English, Greek seems the lesser. As the poem continues, however, the line refers more and more to intralingual translation and the generative project of integrating ancient and modern Greek into a national language in the present. Despite how hard this is to do, the poem suggests, it is what Greek poetry should do. If the continuity of our language envelops us, like the ancient Greek shirt of the centaur, bringing the sea to where we can find the mountain water in present-day Pelion, the burden to live up to the past can become productive, not only poison, but medicine, not only illness, but cure. As the poem continues, it probes what it means to copy Europe, how unsatisfying interlingual imitation is, but also how the purest way of copying the ancients by resuscitating ancient Greek words and forms no longer in use is the wrong way. Such archaicizing only calls attention to the inadequacy of modern Greek. Zephyrus's manner, a metagraphic manner, will be more organic because it will show how earlier forms of the Greek language are already a part of the Greek spoken and written today. In the poem, Seferis parodies the unreality of the purest artificial katharevusa by juxtaposing contradictions like erhete ex homonias with colloquial phrases about eating ice cream, kufeta, sugared almonds, sositricha, hair tonic. The point is that like imitating the French a la manière de, the purest artificial copying of ancient Greek is not a dynamic process of exchange. Over the course of the poem, to translate in the manner of GS means to replace imitation, the andigraphic copying, with integration, the metagraphic, living with and after. It is this manner of translating that best helps the poet deal with exile and shows Greece, a nation of exiles and failed irredentism from Magna Grecia to Asia Minor, a way to imagine herself as whole again. 
In the last two stanzas of the poem, ancient Greek becomes fully integrated into modern Greek. Not only are ancient names and places left in, but even an ancient Greek phrase from Aeschylus's Agamemnon is there with no translation. Oromen anthun telagos eion nekris. The ancient line shares its object, nekris, with the repeated modern Greek subject, ekini, of the next two lines. So the word corpses and those in English. Στο μεταξύ η Ελλάδα ταξιδεύει όλο ένα ταξιδεύει και αν ο Ρώμεν ανθούν πέλαγος Αιγαίων νεκρής είναι εκείνοι που θέλησαν να πιάσουν το μεγάλο καράβι με το κολύμπι εκείνοι που βαρέθηκαν να περιμένουν τα καράβια που δεν μπορούν να κινήσουν. In contradistinction to the jarring archaisms of Katharevosa earlier in the poem, Zephyrus here creates a demotic context of linguistic and cultural continuity by which the ancient corpses are one and the same with the corpses floating in the sea of not knowing what will happen in that summer of 1936. Those who tried to catch the big ship by swimming after it, those who got tired of waiting for the ships that cannot move, the ship and the captain, ancient and modern. Edmund Keeley's and Philip Sherrard's translation, the one I've been quoting, does a magnificent job of underscoring and bringing Seferis's project of building a national language and literature to an Anglophone post-war readership. It is a modern poem, resonant with intertexts from the poetry of T.S. Eliot, Seamus Haney, Robert Frost. In fact, it makes Seferis a part of the European tradition of French and English poetry that the exilic insecurities I have been describing made seem out of reach. If, um, if my reading of the poem shows Seferis' imagining the intralingualism of ancient and modern Greek as a better bet for consecrating minor poetry at the edges of Europe, Keeley and Sherrard's reading assumes an interlingual equality from the start. Seferis is presented as a major modern European poet able to parlay in English with the French and English. It is telling, I think, how Keeley and Sherrard translate the name of the hotel where the modern poet and the ancient kings lie next to each other. Doxeno the hio tis oreas elenis du menelao. They turn it into French. Belelen du menela. Rather than focusing on the intralingual connections and using idiomatic English to show how the names of the ancient couple, Helen and Menelaus, are still common names in Greece today, they invent an interlingual connection that repeats the conceit of the poet's title, not as concern, am I as good as the French poets I love, but as confirmation. Indeed, the manner of GS is already French, already European. Insofar as the impact of Keeley and Sherrard's translation included enabling Seferis to earn the Nobel Prize, among many other honors, their interpretation was on the mark, canonizing, put Greek poetry on the international world literature map. But if now, 50 years later, in the centennial year of the population exchange with another European war, sending millions of refugees across borders, a new and different translation is necessary. But what if now a new translation is necessary? One that acknowledges the dangers of nationalism and of the intralingual imaginary in Seferis' poem. This new interpretation is not about dismissing the internationalism of its interlingualism, what, what uh, Keeley and Sherrard gave us, right? The, the most consequential retranslations always include and respond to the argument of earlier translations. The later version needs the earlier one to establish its own necessity. Rather, the point is how one might somehow retain this argument about intralingualism in order to show the precarity of nationalism 
its fragility, in order to remember how every document of culture also is a document of barbarism. Such a translation, again, in the second to last stanza, might try to find a way to invoke the masterful conflation of temporal and spatial expansion in the different meanings of the adverb olo enna, always, continually, but also all of one piece, all together, something that Keeley and Sherrard's translation skips over rather ingeniously by leaving out the adverb altogether and performing the repetition at the level of the verb itself, hoot and hoot. Sfirizun takaravia, tora puvradiazi stompirea, sfirizun oloena, sfirizun maden cuniete canenas, camia alicida den alapse vremeni sto sterno fos pu vasilevi, o capetanios meni mar maromenos mesta aspra que sta chrisa. The ships hoot now that dusk falls on Piraeus, hoot and hoot, but no captain moves, no chain gleams wet in the vanishing light. The captain stands like a stone in white and gold. A new translation might also want to bring, and this is th that was Keely and Sherrard's, right? But a new one might want to bring in the Byzantine connection in these lines. The point would be not only the way the word vasilemenis vanished in the poem's first stanza is echoed here in vasilevi, right, linking the passing of a vanished youth, vasilemenis, with the vanishing light at the end of the day, stosterno fos pu vasilevi. But again, how is this connected for Seferis to imagining a continuous tradition? The word vasilemeni, as well as meaning vanishing or waning, also means royal. Well, vasilevi, as well as setting, means reigns. And both meanings refer to the purple-red color of the robes of Byzantine emperors. In fact, this is the reason uh, the sunset with the sky that turns a deep, deep purple-red is called uh, vas ilio vasilema, right? And so these are connections. I think the Kilian Sherrard translation did an amazing job of, of doing the, the repetition, which is a wonderful sort of part of what Anglo-American poetry does, right? The repetition of vanished and vanishing. But I think that there's something else that could happen here. Um, as with the doubled olo enna, the repeated color association um, in Vasilemeni and Vasilevi foregrounds continuity from the purple red of the Byzantines to that of the vanishing light of the setting sun in the summer of Metaxas' August regime. And finally, when Seferis' Mar Maromenos, um, when rendering Seferis' Mar Maromenos, this new translation could emphasize the importance of the same marble now and then that connects the modern captain to an ancient statue. Rather than Keely and Sherrard's um, more generic, like a stone, a phrase that just as well, and obviously on purpose, given what they're trying to do with establishing him as a European, American, English poet, could just as well be from an American poet, Robert Lowell, Frost. This new translation would want to make clear that this isn't any old stone, but marble like an ancient statue, so as to underscore the poem's mode of understanding translation as a way of healing a rift and making the Greek language the language of a historically unified culture. It would also want to show that when the first line, wherever I travel, Greece wounds me, is repeated in the final stanza, it is not only because the poet is suffering, but as with the updated meanings of olo enna, from always to all of a piece or all together, and vasilevi from vanishing to one with Byzantium up to today, it is because the struggle is ongoing and the resilience of the modern Greek language bears out this historical fact. If the agony of displacement is not simply a modern pr problem, not simply a sign of Greece's standstill in 1936, but a continual one, if the wounds are ancient and Byzantine as well, it is a more tolerable plight the problem of being in exile, of being away from home, is easier to take if even the great ancients suffered it too. Agamemnon, Orestes, Cassandra, Menelaus, Helen. This is an important part of what Seferis' poem seems to be arguing. 
The new translation I'm suggestion would want, suggesting would want to highlight that is, it is its investment in intralingualism that shows how Greece endures, and by enduring, shares in and perpetuates the greatness of the ancients. Maybe the word travel in English doesn't strike the right tone now in the 21st century of ubiquitous tourism. Too trivial? Maybe it is more about being on the move like exiles and refugees and the contrast between motionlessness and movement, staying put and leaving. Maybe simply wherever I go, Greece wounds me. Because Cephas has been canonized, because his translators have achieved this, it is now possible to question the unexamined romantic connection between exile, nationalism, and continuity, and to wonder whether a translation that lets another story of insecurity and hyperbole emerge might not help us see that intralingual translation across 3,000 years is as much a fiction as the imagined community of the nation it is meant to uphold. Here, not written down yet, not printed, but simply read aloud is what such a translation might sound like in the style of GS. Wherever I go, Greece wounds me. In Pelion, amidst the chestnut trees, this is not on your handout. This is not printed. In the mono edo, daixi. Okay, in the style of GS, wherever I go, Greece wounds me. In Pelion, amidst the chestnut trees, the centaur's shirt slid through the leaves to wrap around my body. As I climbed the slope, the sea followed me like mercury climbing a thermometer until we found the mountain stream. In Santorini, I reached for islands as they sunk, listening to the flute play in the pockmarked stone, an arrow suddenly let loose. From the sunset, youth of a Byzantium now gone, nailed my hand to the boat rail. In Mycenae, I lifted the large rocks and treasures of the Atreus kings, then lay down with them in the hotel Pretty Helen, of Menelaus, until at dawn they left when Cassandra crowed, a rooster strapped around her black neck. In Spetsis, in Poros, and in Mykonos, the Barcaroles made my fever worse. What do they mean when they say they happen to be in Athens or Piraeus? The one who hearkens from Salamina asks the other whence from, ammonia perchance. No syndagma, he answers satisfied and adds, I bumped into Yanis and we had ice cream. All the while, Greece is on the go. We do not know a thing. We do not know what offshore means. We do not know the acrid taste of ports. When ships leave, we make fun of those who do. Odd people who say they happen to be in Attica when they are nowhere who buy kufeta for their weddings and pose for photographs holding hair loss remedies. The man I saw today seated against a background of pigeons and flowers, let the old photographer smooth the wrinkles on his face left by all the birds of the sky. All the while, Greece is on the move, on the move altogether. And if we see the ancient blossom with the dead, they are this. If, and if we see the ancient Aegean blossom with the dead, they are the swimmers who tried to catch the great ship, those who tired of waiting for ships that never moved, the Elsa, the Samothrace, the Amvrakiko. The ships sound their horns as night falls in Piraeus. They sound their horns all together, but no cranks move, no chains shimmer wet, in the red sunset, the captain remains marble, still, white and gold. Wherever I go, Greece wounds me. The mountain curtains, the archipelago, the naked granite. They call the ship that moves Agonia 937. Thank you.
σήμερα στις εκδηλώσεως. Σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ε, συμμετείχατε στην αναγόρευση της κυρίας Κάρεν Βαντάικ.